so many different styles of music that uh, it's, it's hard. And, and I, I think, you know, Sting is a good example of that. He was very um, open. And so initially when I was uh, playing with Paquito, he was starting a record company called Pangea. Hmm, okay. Um, and he came to listen to Paquito and heard me and heard me playing classical and jazz uh, and all the different styles I played and, you know, called me up and asked me if I would, you know, send him a some kind of tape, yeah, a demo tape. And then I, I had to, at that moment, sit down and take stock. And that was a really good moment for me because I was able to say, well, I play electric guitar and I, I play a, all these different styles, but this music that I've been writing for Spanish guitar that's kind of jazz oriented mm -hmm. is, is I think what I'm gonna put on this demo tape. And, and, and on the strength of that, he signed me to his label. Wow. Um, It's Mike Jeff for Chicago Jazz Magazine, and welcome to our December 2018 feature interview with Fareed Hawk, the legendary guitarist here from Chicago, but parts all over the world, I do believe. So we're going to get into all of that. Of course, you can see the entire issue at chicagojazzmagazine.com. Fareed, it is an honor to have you here sitting down talking about the new recording you have coming out on Delmark, plus everything else, uh, your influences, all, I mean, you know, you and I talked before we came on camera, obviously we could talk for seven hours about everything <laughs> you've done. So I'm going to try to whittle it, <laughs> exactly, I'm going to try to whittle it down a little bit. Why don't we start right off the top here, you've got a brand new recording yep. out mm -hmm. on Delmark Records. The and new Delmark Records. The new Delmark Records, right. that's right, with uh, this, the old name, with the new owners, mm -hmm. and uh, they're doing fantastic stuff. Yeah, and I think one of the job. things that I'm noticing that they're doing is they're starting to bring out some different stuff other than just jazz and blues. Mm -hmm. And the new recording you have is the with the... Uh, Kaya. Kaya. String string quartet. Quartet. I let you say that, oh, so I didn't okay. screw it up right <laughs> off the bat. Boy. So it's uh, it's entitled Fareed Hawk and the Kaya String Quartet, New Latin American Music for Guitar and String Quartet. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. that falls right into your wheelhouse because obviously Latin classical jazz, everything else. Sure, but why sure. don't we talk specifically about this recording before yeah. we get into everything else. Yeah. How did this recording come about? Now, you've recorded with Kaya, not few, recorded, but performed with yeah. them several times. Yeah. But how did this specific recording come about? Um, the uh, Chicago Latino Music Festival. Um, well, I should give some backstory. You know, I've been, I've been teaching at NIU for 30 years, yeah. uh, Northern Illinois University, teaching both jazz and classical guitar. And Kaya was in residency there. Uh, as a string oh, quartet, okay. um, uh, studying with uh, our resident string qu quartet there, and um, the Avalon String Quartet, mm -hmm. and so they were, you know, both. We, we I realized, you know, they were really uh, interested in Latin American music. I was doing all this Latin American music, and uh, the Chicago Latino Music Festival was working with them and reaching out to me to do some projects. So it was natural that. They would put us together. Elbio Barilari, mm -hmm. um, who uh, produces the uh, Chicago Latino Music Festival, along with uh, a few other great folks, um, teaches uh, Latin American studies at um, UIC. Get this right, UIC. Right. And then he also um, hosts a radio program called Fiesta mm -hmm. on WFMT radio. And so he got us together to do some concerts and performances as part of the Latino Music Festival, promoted on FMT. We enjoyed playing together so much, we decided we would go ahead and record this music and then put out an album. And then, coincidentally, as it's a very small little town, this cow town we call Chicago, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, an old friend of mine, Julia Miller, is uh, partners with LBO. Mm -hmm. And they together have taken over Delmark Records. So it was a natural to take this new recording and. Uh, oh, it just falls it right out. into place. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you were playing because I was I was uh, doing a little research online. I mean, you've been playing with uh, the string quartet more than just recently. I mean, it's been like yeah. what three, four, five years that you've done some concerts and sure. things like that. Sure. And 
What is different with this music? Is this original stuff specific to this album? Did you do any performing of this before? We, we played this pieces a few times. I mean, you, you know, with classical music, it's 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 certainly less spontaneous than than the jazz right. experience. You know, you really have to put in your time rehearsing and learning the music. And um, I arranged uh, one of the the main pieces on this album is uh, the Five Tango Sensations by Astor Piazzolla. And uh, Astor Piazzolla is a, a famous name in Argentine modern tango world. Mm -hmm. He played the bandoneon, which is like the Argentine accordion. Okay. Um, and wrote a lot of great music. Uh, but few people know that he was actually raised in New York and was a big jazz fan. Oh. So his Argentine roots were always connected to jazz. And he improvised quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So having played a lot of Latin American music and having a, an affinity for you know, Latin American styles and being an improviser, it was a perfect fit for me to take the uh, bandoneon parts that he was playing, which mm -hmm. are in the same register as the guitar, and arrange that for guitar along with this piece that was written originally for the Kronos Quartet okay, with, uh, with Astro Piazzolla playing the bandoneon. And so I uh, arranged this piece for guitar with the Kaya String Quartet, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's a lot of improvisation in there. And so it was a good showcase for some of my skill set. That's what I was going to ask you with, with this type of thing, because obviously the improvisation in classical music, uh, well, you're going to know more about this than me, but I, I think probably it doesn't really necessarily exist because you're playing stuff on the page, right? I mean, when you're doing a classical piece, you're playing what's on the page. How many hours do we have? Seven, seven hours. <laughs> I, right? I know, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so the, the, I'm the, trying the, not the... to go down the wormholes, man. <laughs> <laughs> we're going down. We're going down. <laughs> Quick. So the, the, the short version is that actually improvisation is very much at the heart of classical music. Hmm. And it's only in the last couple, 150 years, that improvisation has been sort of removed almost forcibly mm -hmm. from the context of classical music. So in, in the Baroque, it was uh, common for accompanists to read chord symbols. Really? Accompanying sonatas by Vivaldi, by Bach, by Corelli. So they just many, had many, chord, many. chord symbols like a jazz chart. There's right. the chord symbols right. and you voice however you want to voice things. Right, exactly. So it's a different notation system. Sure. And it, it was called figured bass. And so you'd have the bass line and you'd be seeing the melody mm -hmm. and then you'd have some symbols and you got to fill in. Wow. Right? Yeah. So that's just like what a jazz musician yeah. does. You look at the bass line, you look at the changes, you fill it in, you make it sound good, or you get fired. I wish you would have taught <laughs> I wish you would have taught theory at North Texas when I was there because I couldn't understand anything that was happening. But now I suddenly understand it. Thank so you. you everybody studied figured bass <laughs> yeah. as four part choir writing. Yes. Which is not really what it is. What it really is is You can't do parallel fifths, you can't do all this crazy stuff. Well I remember what, that. what it really is is here's how you accompany a sonata. That makes sense. You know, in the Baroque style. Yeah. And, you know, so from there, in the classical period, Mozart, early Beethoven, Haydn, um, and many, many other composers, there was a common practice to improvise cadenzas, improvise um, embellishments and ornamentation. I mean, there's a, a sonata written by Telemann where he uses it as a teaching tool. So he has one page, which is what is written on the page, and the next page is what he expects the really? soloist to play. Wow. And here you've got, you know, like three notes on the on per line, a couple of half notes, a couple of whole notes, little phrasing marks. And over here it's full of sixteenth notes and black with ornamentation. Yeah. And uh, and in fact one of the complaints by most serious Baroque composers and early classical period composers was, man, dudes are improvising way too much. You gotta <laughs> respect the tune. You gotta respect the tune. Same thing we say about you know singers today. Right. You know you gotta right. respect the tune. You gotta play the tune, know the song. Mm -hmm. Right. As a jazz you know pedagogue, the same same issues come up, and you look back at the the writings of composers you know two hundred and fifty years ago, and you see oh same story, you know different days. That's what's story. amazing. It's a, it's the same kind of complaint from musicians to soloists or whatever it is. You're playing too much. You're doing this. You're doing that. You're not accompanying me the way I want to be accompanied. Sure. So it yeah. goes all the way back to then. Absolutely. Oh, that's amazing. What happened is, uh, you know, people say, oh, you know, rock and roll music is so loud. But the truth is, classical musicians, they want the shit louder. Really? Louder. 
Beethoven didn't put, you know, cannons in his, in his 1820, <laughs> you know, for nothing, right? And uh, so they wanted some noise, and the orchestras kept getting bigger. And so all of a sudden you had a situation where in order to get a job, you had to be able to play the notes on the page and not change them. Oh. So now you had the most respected musicians on the planet, or the European planet, I should say, mm -hmm. not to be too... Right, right. <laughs> uh, saying, well, you know, I, I play at the King's Court, I'm part, part of the King's Orchestra, and, uh, and I don't improvise, because that's what low-class musicians do. Oh. I only play what's on the page. I only play what the composer tells me to do. And, and so that changed the whole mentality. You know, with with the volume wise too, which is interesting to me because I never thought of it this way. But I mean, I suppose you're right because a lot of this stuff was in church, right? It was in like uh, Bach and Mozart and everybody. It was they were writing for the church, right? And when you get to the volume thing, it only makes sense at that point. You can't turn up amplifiers; you just add more instrumentation. Right. When they were doing that. Were they allowing, I mean, like if you're playing in Mozart's orchestra, is he allowing improvisation to happen? Or that you have to you kind can. of dial it down, when right? Got, when you got 20 or twenty violinists, or at that point yeah. probably it was more like nine or ten violinists, all playing the first violin part in unison. Yeah, you can't improvise. Yeah, you're yeah. Gonna, it's going to sound like, you know, hurting, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> skinny cats, you know. <laughs> have them all playing different ornaments and improvising. And they got a bow exactly the same way. Right. You know, there's all these things that, that became a part of the culture of orchestra. Just out of necessity because you want more volume, you want a bigger crowd so that bigger you're playing, sound. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so that that whole, you know, you know, I mean, Beethoven played his piano concertos um, and people looked over his shoulder at his piano part and it was just bar lines. Wow. You know, he played it all, you know, by heart and improvised his cadenzas. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes I do that where I play classical pieces and I'll just improvise the cadenza. And that's exciting for the audience. And in fact, that's what the piece was written to do. You, you, there's a, there's a, the piece is written and about the three quarter point, there's a rest with a fermata, a little dot with a little thing. Oh. And there's no music there. So it's like it's, the rest is telling you to wait. And then the fermata is telling you to wait. Isn't that kind of redundant? Right, right. right. Well, what it usually means is that's your spot. That's the soloist spot. Blow. Right, right. Yeah. Or don't, you know. Sure. But if you can, it's your spot. You yeah. Know? And, um, and so bringing that energy back into classical music is something that I'm trying to do. And a lot of, you know, to be fair, I think it's more and more of a current movement in classical music. So it's not me alone. I think there are, there are many, many musicians who are more comfortable with, with improvisation. But with getting comfortable with improvisation comes getting comfortable with different musical styles. Mm -hmm. You know, and are we going to play a milonga with some understanding of what that Argentine or, or uh, Uruguayan rhythm is? Right. Are we going to play a tango or different kinds of, of uh, Mexican. We had some Mexican music also reported mm -hmm. by Eduardo Angulo. And um, there's a lot of Mexican rhythms on that. And you have to have at least a, an understanding, you know, of, of some of those those rhythms and those the culture of that music. Yeah, well, and, and that kind of brings us back to your early beginnings because, I mean, you know, we're talking about the improvisation stuff. And you grew up in a house now i'm i'm curious because your your father was pakistani and your mother was chilean mm -hmm. and then reading through your background it says that you traveled a lot what was the why were they just big world travelers or was well, there something I mean, work wise or a uh, work wise initially okay. my dad uh is a microbiologist and uh and uh he um cuz you were born in chicago right so born, born in, in yeah. chicago um and he was teaching at um university of illinois at Chicago mm -hmm. for many years, he's retired now. And uh, but he was sent uh, over to Iran as an advisor uh, to a university in, in northern Iran in Tabriz. And um, in addition to that, I mean, you know, it wasn't really over the river and through the woods to visit <laughs> grandma and grandpa. We had to go to Chile. Right, right. We had to go to Pakistan. Oh, so their first uh, first uh, generation, generation. Yep. yeah, yeah. And so. Uh, even from a very young age, you know, soon after my parents got married and uh, I, when I was born, there was to, to meet the parents. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, so they had a, it was a long trip, you know. So I spent time in Pakistan when I was very young, in Chile when I was very young. And it's a different time. I mean, travel was more accessible. 
It was more accessible. Way more accessible. It was easier I mean, to get in and out and do anything you wanted, basically. Probably. And I, I think making stopovers was was a lot less expensive. Hmm. Okay. Um, it was, in general, quite a bit less stressful to travel. Um, people don't like hearing this, but uh, Islamic countries were much, much more liberal hmm. at that time yeah. than they are now. Um. Uh, Western countries were much, much more liberal. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? At that yeah. time than they are now. Yeah. And so, you know, I have students who are terrified even just to go home for Christmas break because they might not get back in the country, you know. And, I know. Uh, and many, many layers of, uh, of complexity uh, that we didn't have. So uh, we ended up spending a lot of time in Spain on the way to Iran, on the way to Pakistan. Yeah, stopovers. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in France, I had some friends. My parents had some friends and... Honestly, I don't even know how, but my parents just left me in Paris for a week or two by <laughs> myself. Was, by yourself? Yeah, yeah. Like I in a hotel? A, an apartment, a friend's apartment. Oh, really? And uh, if Johnny Sims is out there, hey, Johnny. <laughs> uh, he was hanging out with Johnny Sims, who was a, a session guitarist living living at that time in, in Paris. Okay. How old were you? I mean, were, was this teenage? 14. Yeah. Yeah. Were you playing guitar at that point? Were a little you, bit, yeah, enough. It's kind of noodling around. Yeah. That, I mean, what what made you want to play guitar as opposed to anything else? I mean, if you're exposed to all of these different cultures going in and out, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously the percussion, you know, sure. realm of the whole thing would be the first driving factor, I would imagine, because all these different rhythms and stuff. But what drew you over to the guitar specifically? Um, it's not that romantic. I, I, I started with piano lessons. Okay. And I enjoyed piano. And then mom said, hey, you should play guitar because it's easier to travel with a guitar than a piano. And I was like, yeah. That's cool. And, and the kids were like, wow, you play guitar. You can play Led Zeppelin. I was like, I can play Led Zeppelin. So then I got in like the local rock band and was playing piano first. Sure. And then the, one of the kids couldn't play the intro to, to Stairway to Heaven on guitar. And I said, well, I can play it. So why don't I play the guitar part? And then I became the guitar player. And then you realize how much cooler it was to play the intro to Stairway to Heaven on guitar yeah, rather than piano, way, right? Way <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, um... You know, I like to say that, that you know, my mother is from Chile, my, my dad is from Pakistan, but I'm from Chicago. Mm -hmm. Because uh, so much of, of, of the musical universe that I inhabit, I can trace back as much to Chicago as to anywhere else. I mean, I used to spend a lot of time, my parents, God bless them, you know, they would give me the, the Chrysler and I would drive down from Glen Ellen, Illinois, to 75th and King Drive. Other place to the Matador, and and, and go sit in with with Vaughn and yeah. and sit at blues clubs. How old were you then? Yeah, I mean, underage, obviously. I was right? totally underage. Yeah, yeah. I just just had my license when I was sixteen, seventeen, <laughs> and uh, I mean, I remember going to get gas at four in the morning. Vaughn Freeman would always come out. He had his cane. Mm -hmm. He was buff. He was tough. You yeah, know? And he come and he come help me in the club, and I was like, what? Yeah, I'm, I can carry this. You know? Yeah. And I didn't know until years later that he was like, this fool. <laughs> yeah, he's coming out here, carrying his hand, carrying yeah. the guitar, driving his big old <laughs> boat, you know, yeah. in this neighborhood. I remember stopping to get gas at like five in the morning after a jam session once, you know, and and a couple of gentlemen were just like, what are you doing here? You need to get in your car. And get out. Go, <laughs> get, go away. Go back to where you came from, man. <laughs> you know, and in a kind way. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, I was pretty clueless. But you know, at, at that, that time, point, but though, I never too, received any no, kind of negative energy. No, and and know. I think, um, you know, I kind of had the same sim similar situation, you know. But I don't think of, I would never think about it that way. I was just like, okay, well, I'm going to see Vaughn, or I'm going to right. see, you know, whoever, John Young, or whoever's yeah. whoever's mm -hmm. out and about. And never even, I never thought about different neighborhoods being funky or not. At and that I point. think that's that's part of where that all comes from. Is I think if it's not on your radar, you know. If it's not on your radar, then sometimes it's not on anybody's radar. Right. It just kind of goes away. You know, you're not framing everything you do in terms of culture and race and economy and you know poverty or wealth or whatever. Right. You know, maybe it's just being foolish, but well, sometimes that's innocent. <laughs> as, well, as a musician, though, I think I think uh, you know, and you've traveled all over the world and you've played with, I mean, you know, everybody. But I think there's that one common thing, especially with the jazz kind of based guys, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they've hung out in clubs, they've hung out, they've gone, they've done whatever. So, I mean, you could be playing with a super famous jazz guy at Symphony Center and they're 
they'll come and hang out. They don't care. It's not a big deal. Right. And I think it comes up from that, right? Because that's how you get your chops. That's how you get your influences. So during that time, you must have been starting to learn tunes and and just like everybody else, getting told that, hey, man, you should go work on that. And, right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and sent home. and Totally. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I mean, the challenge for me was that, that I, I had this, you know, wonderful Chicago experience, this wonderful world experience, but I didn't really have a, a home base mm-hmm. culturally. Mm. You know, it wasn't like I was Indo-Pakistani and then embrace this Latin thing and then embrace this American thing. Right. You know, my parents didn't even speak to each other in their own language. Oh, really? Because they had to speak in English. Yeah. In my dad's first languages or do my mom's first language is Spanish. So it was always this, this little bit of a, you know, where, where am I fitting in? And um, so at a certain point I was like, well, I, I know a lot of tunes, but huh, how many of them are classical guitar tunes? that nobody else in this particular universe has any idea about. Right. You know? And then I would be working with singers, and I'd learn a lot of singers' tunes, but I wouldn't necessarily learn the Wayne Shorter tunes. Right. You know, because that really wasn't part of my world. I wasn't that interested in, at that point, I wasn't that interested in sort of the Island Car Jazz movement. I was more like, I was backing up Bill Murray <laughs> at the Star Wars Lounge, you know? I did those kind of gigs, you know? Yeah. And uh, it was way less about, you know, Wayne Shorter and more, more about Bad Bad Leroy Brown. Yeah. <laughs> I played at the Copper Box uh, down on the, on the south side. <laughs> not the Copper Box. It's not the Copper Box. What is it? The Cop Her Box. Okay. <laughs> Three syllables. <laughs> hey, whatever and, works. Uh, it's a marketing plan for, them, for somebody. You know? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it was an interesting, very... Uh, culturally diverse upbringing, but it wasn't necessarily so super artsy fartsy. Were you were you somebody when you started, so when you're playing, what made you start to learn tunes? I mean, because you know, you don't just pick up the guitar, you're playing Stairway to Heaven, and then the next thing you know, you're playing like Moments Notice or something. I mean, what where's that transition from the rock band stuff to all of a sudden starting to play tunes, you know, jazz tunes, chords, changes? It's mostly gigs. Yeah? Mostly you gigs. You just realize, well, I better, what? Chord is that? What what is right, that? What is that? Right. Yeah. I started to get I mean, I had always had guitar lessons. Okay. So I was always uh, you know, well studied. Um but to be fair, a lot of the formal education was so far away from the actual real experiences that I was having out on in, in clubs and on gigs, that there was a pretty big disconnect. Mm-hmm. You know, and um the more I played gigs, the more I realized that what I was doing at the university wasn't really necessarily going to help me. Right. Um, so that's when I, I transferred out. You so know. you were in North, you went to North Texas. Right. So right, right. right after high school, you decided, yeah. okay, I want to become a, a, cause who was down oh, God, there? I wish it was that glorious. <laughs> no, I decided I wasn't going to do music cause it was, it was just like, I was more, you know, I, I was going to take a year off and maybe practice and see. Yeah. And well, and also your father's like, you know, at the University of Chicago and all that. So you have these other influences, too, right, I'm right. sure, that wasn't like, hey, go hang out in clubs and let's let's do this for the rest of your life, right? Yeah, my, my, my dad initially was, was supportive, but he didn't really see it as a career, which I think was probably, you know, a healthy attitude at first. You know, let's not shut, sure. let's not run into this, let's not jump into this, you know. Right. And, uh, but my uh, band director in high school um, had arranged a meeting with Rich Madison, from North Texas, mm-hmm. and I jammed with him a little bit, and, uh, and he said, "Oh, how'd the audition go?" I was like, "What audition?" <laughs> like, "Oh, that was an audition." I was like, "Oh, oh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it went okay. I guess we had fun." <laughs> you you know? just thought that you were jamming. That's like the best audition, right? Right. right? No stress. And so um, then I didn't hear anything from anybody, and I was like, "Oh, I guess I didn't make it in." Well, that'll be good. I'll practice for a year and figure out if I want to go into the sciences or what I wanted yeah. to do. And then about two days before classes started, I got a call from Rich that, you know, we, we lost your information. We just found it. You have the Jazz Guitar Scholarship. Can you be here Monday? And it was like... Monday? <laughs> it was like Saturday, you know. And Did you know like, where it was? I mean, Denton, Texas isn't, isn't exactly a metropolis, especially no, not at that point, not then, right? Not then, no. I didn't really, but my parents were just as nuts as I am. And so they were like, let's get in the car. Let's go. It'd be awesome. <laughs> you drove there? Let's go. You know. 
So we drove there. Oh. We packed. I, can't, I had students at the time. I was teaching in the music store, so I canceled all my students. Yeah. They got down there, and I, I, I did a, a year at North Texas. And, uh, and I got a lot out of it. I mean, Jack Peterson's guitar classes and working with Rich and Dan Hurley and all the folks down there was, was fantastic. Um, but I also got offered um, some, some money to come to Northwestern to study classical. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I mean, yeah. there's not a lot of work in Denton. <laughs> there's a ton of work in Chicago. Yeah. I'm learning more about jazz in the clubs than I am in the classroom. Yeah. And I could really learn a lot about classical music and about all kinds of music at Northwestern. And, you know, it's there's a million reasons. So sure. we did that. And uh, You know, that with, with just uh, with North Texas, and this is the thing that I found kind of kind of a common denominator, even if you're there for a year. But you go down there to somewhere like that or Berkeley or Miami, you know, some big music school, Indiana. You get an experience that you probably wouldn't get if you just stayed locally because you see – all the other people when there's that many people. So it's yeah. like, even if you're only there for a year, you, you get a sense of, whoa, I, this is like some serious, these guys are my age right. and they're from all over the world and they, they can play. There were, I would say 45 guitarists in the very first guitar class freshman year. <laughs> and I think there were 13 in the second semester. Really? Yeah. 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 And you had to say, you had to throw down. Yeah. You know, and I was really that geeky, you know, that I was just like, mm -hmm. no, 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 you're not. No, you're not going to take my spot. You know, right? I was. Well, that's that's like real life too. I mean, to a certain extent. I mean, oh, especially at that, that age. You know, I mean that. And I see it now. I mean, I I see it now, having taught at a university uh, setting, in a, a program that's that's modeled after Jack's program mm -hmm. loosely. Um, seen a lot of guitar students go through over the thirty years, mm -hmm. and you start to recognize, you know what what it takes. And then I look back at, at myself and I'm like, damn, you were a goof. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was so into it. I was so into it. I had no idea. I mean, I think partly that was part of the work ethic that my parents instilled in me, but I was just, I mean, I would practice until I, I wake up but in the morning. But that's also the culture when you go to a place like that. At least that's what I found too. I mean, you go down there, it's not like you're in a fraternity and you're no. hanging out in college. Mm -hmm. It's like you're, I mean, I always tell everybody, yeah, I went to college. It was like a hell. I was like in hell for three yeah. years. It was like yeah. a music hell, a good situation, right. but it wasn't like it was a fun time that mm -hmm. you're hanging out down there, you know? No, it was intense and good. Um, so when you come back up to Northwestern, now you go from the jazz stuff and everything else. Now you're straight into the classical and I was still playing in the jazz ensemble under Don Owens. Okay. Great experience with Don. So, and I was, there was local clubs that I was starting to play at. I was already writing music. And so there was a context for me to play some of that music. And, uh, and then gigging more and more, you know, I think my skill set is someone who could play nylon and electric and, and, you know, competent jazz. Sure. Um, became more in demand. I was also, this also sessions. I was yeah, doing back jingles. then, right? There was still still set, a lot of jingles. Is it like the eighties or late eighties, early nineties and stuff? Yep. So eighty six I got back to Chicago. Okay, so that was still working town oh, yeah. for jingles and stuff, right? Yeah. And that especially somebody your age that can read and play all these different styles. Totally. So they needed a flamenco guitarist for the uh the Taco Bell ad. Yeah. The, the, there's so many of them I did. I had a blast doing them. Well, and plus it, you get to meet all these musicians too, yeah, right? I yeah. mean it's like yeah, you meet a lot of musicians, and then, you know, again, it, there is something about Chicago, which which I think the reason I frame myself as a Chicagoan is because unlike New York, unlike San Francisco and L.A., it's a local scene. Mm -hmm. Like, no matter how well established you are, nobody's a star in Chicago. Right. You know, you're just like a, a grunt. <laughs> and, and, and that's great. Yeah. You know, because people play together and evolve together and... And rehearse together and, you know, come over to my pad and let's go over this music. And I'm going to rehearse with Goran later on today. Mm -hmm. We're going to learn some new music. And we got to, I got a recital tonight, a different thing. You know, it's just this, this, this working local scene of musicians. I got together with, uh, with Suso yesterday, uh, Fode Musa Suso, mm -hmm. plays the Chora. We rehearsed some new music that we we're thinking about doing in a couple of years. You know, in New York City, that, that kind of thing still happens, but it's not the same. Yeah, everybody's kind of a, you know, I'm I'm who I am, and I have my career, and I have this, and I don't do. Hey, come over, let's have a 
cup of coffee or tea right. or a drink or just jam or whatever. It's not as much of that as it is in Chicago. Yeah. I really think that's an important reason that Chicago has been such a, a crucible for, for music. Well, so also, long. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that move from New York to Chicago or they moved to New York and then they come back to Chicago because of that same thing, I think. It, it, they just, it, there's no, it's such a tight knit, small community, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a lot of work in Chicago. I mean, look at all the stuff you're able to do yeah. just in town, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, I had many opportunities to move to, to New York and the universe got in the way every time. Yeah. You know, once it was going out on the road with, with Joe, um, once it was, uh, Oh yeah, a uh, wedding. <laughs> you know, I was getting married, and I was like, "Oh well, okay, yeah, I guess I'm not gonna rent that place because now we're over here." You know, then I got the job, mm -hmm. and not you, and it was like, "Well, you know, it's yeah, a nice gig. That's a great know. gig." Um, so I had opportunities, and they always fell through at the last minute, and it was kind of, you know, for the best. Mm -hmm. Glad I, mean, I see a lot of my friends who live in New York, who tour a great deal, and they have access to certain tours that I might not. But that's changed now in the last last years with the internet and, and it's not really so local. I was going to say, I mean, for somebody like you, I can't imagine that if you lived in New York, you would get all that many more opportunities as opposed to living in Chicago because you're an established name. It's not sure. like you're walking down the street and they say, Fareed, thank God I found you. Come on, man, let's go <laughs> Let's go on a 20-city tour or something. Right. I mean, you know, they're going to right. call you, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I go to New York and just hang out, I always walk away with a couple of gigs. Yeah. So it happens. It's part of it. But yeah, in general, I don't think it's as much of an issue as it was, say, certainly not as it was 50 years ago. Sure. It was really about being in that in that scene. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and so you're at Northwestern, and uh, you're doing classical stuff, still playing in clubs and everything. How did you end up meeting, because I think this was uh, one of the major, uh, you know, kind of the, the connection points, is Howard Levy. Yeah. Did you Absolutely. meet him when you were at Northwestern, or was it after Northwestern? Because he seemed to have at, uh, at, connected at that, you with a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Howard and I have a ton of history. Yeah. How many hours did we have? Well, uh, we're down to four. <laughs> <laughs> Howard and I have a ton of history. Almost all of it good, but some of it pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. We, we was, you know, Let's just you, focus on the bad stuff, folks. Yeah, <laughs> it's more it's interesting. Um, Howard and I, I love Howard, and we love each other dearly. And we've we've played so many gigs, we've been so many places together, but um, and I'm just teasing. We it's really a, a very yeah, great he's, a, relationship. he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, uh, uh, I think Ernie Denoff, who's the guitarist in Chevrolet, uh, moved to L.A. for a while, and they needed a replacement. And then they got me to play guitar in Chevrolet because it's a Latin band. Seems like so, a perfect fit, right? right? I mean, right up your alley. It was, it was a good fit. Yeah. Um, I mean, to be fair to Ernie, it was his gig, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he kind of shaped it, you know, to, around his style. And it, he definitely does that gig better than I do. Yeah. But I can pull it off. Yeah. You know, and um, then he came back to Chicago after a while. And so we both played because they didn't want to fire me. Right. But, and after a while, I was like, dude, it's all good, right? You know, <laughs> two guitars happening here. Yeah, yeah, it was fun, um, but at, at the same time, uh, Howard was working with Paquito, and Paquito was playing at the Jazz Showcase. Paquito de Rivera mm -hmm. and uh, trumpeter Claudio Roditi. Oh yeah, was a uh, was I think missing a gig for some reason. So rather than hiring a trumpet player, they hired me to to fill in, and that was sort of my audition with Paquito. Ah, okay. And, uh, that was the old showcase on the Blackstone, yep, right? Yep, at the Blackstone, yeah. yep, yep, yep. And uh, it, it went really well, and Paquita was very sweet and complimentary. Um, then if, maybe a month later, I got a postcard. You know, The postcard? Postcard. He would send postcards. You he's know, funny a, he's postcards. a character, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. he's funny, right? Oh, yeah. Because I've seen him, and he just like jokes around the whole time, and oh, then yeah. he starts playing, and it's another thing. But He's definitely, he can push it, you know. He, he had uh, politically incorrect nicknames for everybody. <laughs> you know, mine was Gandhi. Oh, really? <laughs> it wasn't too bad. Or right. Mr. I had these round glasses at the time, so it was Mr. Magoo for a while. <laughs> and, uh, but he sent me some postcards, uh, funny, funny postcards, just to let me know that he was thinking of me. And then finally he had a couple of gigs that he put me on, and then I began to tour with the band regularly. Yeah. 
And um, when was your first gig? I, I I saw you doing an interview at some point, but it was in Miami or something. Is that what <laughs> yeah. one of the first gigs? That's yeah. hilarious. Oh you, yeah. You flew down there and you didn't. It, nobody picked you up, and then you ended up at the thing, and everybody showed up about four hours late, and you're sitting there. Yeah. How how old were you then? Uh gosh. Twenties or so. Yeah, twenties for sure. Yeah. You know, just just there. You know, probably eighty seven. Okay. Eighty six, eighty seven. And just, there's no cell phone, so you're no you're cell there by phone. yourself. Going, I literally got in a cab and told the guy. They told me the hotel was around the airport, so let's just drive in a ring around the airport until we find it. And we did. And it was no big deal. And yeah. I got to the club, and they were like, nobody's here, but, uh, you know, I said, is there a guitar amp? They said, well, we have that. And they had a Shure Vocal Master PA in the corner. For the whole band? For the whole band. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's not going to work. <laughs> How about we go and we go to rent some gear? And yeah. So, and so I was leading the band <laughs> yeah, right, right off the say. bat, you know, and Paquita showed up uh, late and uh, very happy to get my drift. It was <laughs> yeah. Miami in the 80s. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was full, pumped full of energy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but he was happy to see that the entire band, all the back line was set up. Yeah. And uh, that was another reason I probably got the call, but <laughs> call back. <laughs> Make sure he stays on this. He's yeah. on top of this stuff. Yeah. So did you toured with him then? Quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. I think about 10, 11 albums. How did that change your playing at all? I mean, that talk about playing a specific style like that. I mean, he can swing and all that, but I mean, that's very Latin jazz, Cuban, uh, Caribbean jazz style. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I learned a lot about Afro-Cuban music. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, it was Danilo Perez. Yeah. It was... Uh, Giovanni Hidalgo, uh, Mark Walker, um, Ignacio Berroa. Yeah. Uh, so many great musicians. Claudio, of course, Sergio Brandao. I mean, musicians that went through the band. Yeah, that's I mean, just, just, just incredible. Lincoln Goins. Uh, so many great musicians in that band over the years. And um, so I learned a lot about that. And I kind of, you know, Paquito and I, I, I would stay at his place when I would go to New York. Okay. And so he'd hear me playing classical guitar, and he was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. You know, and so we started playing some Laura waltzes together. He wrote a few pieces in that Venezuelan waltz style, mm -hmm. and then he's since gone on to continue to, to embrace guitar repertoire uh, on the clarinet. He's done records with uh, uh, the Assad Brothers, with Berta Rojas, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and uh, and I'm proud to say that I opened that door a little bit for Paquito. Yeah. And together, the two of us were excited to, to to explore that together. We played a lot of that music together on the shows. Mm -hmm. um, just duo, probably, right? Just duo. Just stop yeah. the whole band, and you guys do like a duo piece in the right. middle of it. And, right. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and that's the amazing thing, I mean, that, that I try to wrap my head around, because, I mean, you are, so you're like a chameleon, right? Because you can play jazz, rock, funk classical, all of the different ethnic things. You've also kind of revolutionized the guitar sound, right? I mean, the, the Moog. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a drummer, so you're going to have to walk me through the whole thing. Sure, but, I sure. mean, you've created these different uh, instruments as well, right? So yeah. this is yeah. it's just like organically happening for you as you're doing all of this. One thing leads to another, and you're like, oh, you know, I kind of like this sound. Let's see if we can get this happening or that happening. I think I saw on one of the videos that you're playing like a an electric sitar or something right. along those mm -hmm. lines. I mean, is, is this all organically happening, or is there just little, the universe is handing you this and that and saying, hey, why don't you pretty, talk I'm to pretty this guy? ADD. Yeah. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all over the map. And and it's it's not because um, I'm just, well, I don't know. I'm just curious yeah. about a lot of stuff. And opportunities come my way, and it's sometimes it's hard to say no mm -hmm. to an opportunity that's interesting. Even if it doesn't make career sense, sure. Which most interesting opportunities don't. I know all you about know. it. I started a jazz magazine. I don't know. <laughs> right. <if you're> like, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, hey, well, that's cool, man. It's cool. It's another four hours that we could talk about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, exactly. And, and and you know, at a certain point, you know, I know that I could be more successful if I focused on my brand. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yes. You know, and all of that jargon is is absolutely accurate mm -hmm. and correct. That's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just, you know, I, I have the luxury to be able to say no to things now that I didn't. Um, and so I can pick and choose a little more. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and that's been a good thing. But for the most part, a lot of great opportunities have come my way. And and to be fair to myself, I I definitely I'm a big picture person more than because I'm not coming from one culture. Right. I have to be a big picture person. Mm -hmm. I I can't really ever be a black guy from the south side of Chicago. I can't be an Indian guy. Right. From Delhi, and I can't really be a you know, a, a Hispanic Latin American from Santiago. I can't mm-hmm. quite be any of those things. So I have to kind of see what the commonalities were amongst all these things. And uh, and I think that's where classical music came into the into the picture as a way of saying, wow, you know, I, I don't consider myself a jazz guitarist in a lot of ways. I consider myself an improvising classical guitarist because uh, I can improvise in many different styles. And it's 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 myopic to think that improvisation is only the terrain of jazz musicians. You know, right. I always get frustrated when you when you hear you know, oh, there's you know, this kind of, uh, you know, Indian jazz. You know, is it? Well, it's not really jazz. No, it's Indian music with improvisation, and with drums and bass, and it's great. But we don't need to call it jazz. You know, I think that's a big thing. I think what you're touching on there, because first of all, I think with you, you're. I mean, I'm going to say you're one of the rare uh, musicians that has your own sound, your own voice. So you can do anything you want, mm-hmm. you know, any uh, band you want to create, any sound you want to create, it's Fareed. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that's yeah. that's rare, right? I mean, you can't say that about a lot of people. That's Fareed. So you don't, but I think in the world today, I think everybody wants to try to push things into a certain genre. Mm-hmm. So that they can push it this way or push it that way. However, I think because of the way the internet's happening, and, and you can speak to this probably a lot better, I think that it's it's getting out of that realm now where people are actually not thinking of stuff as oh this is jazz, this is jazz, this is blues, this is because there's there's such a mishmash. Yeah. You know, maybe back in the '40s when Charlie Parker was playing bebop, well that's bebop, that's right. jazz, that's bebop, but right. all of us have been influenced for what, 30, 40, 50 years with all this music and now sure. with you with all the different cultures. How could you even you can't you can't put anything into that genre, into a specific genre right. anymore. I think right. it's just the way the world is, right? Yeah. And I think it's I think it's okay. I just think the important thing is to uh, embrace the roots of mm-hmm. whatever you're interested in. I think a lot of the access to the internet and access to different cultures sometimes encourages young musicians, young artists to only see the surface. Mm, yeah. You know, if I want to play like John McLaughlin, I can transcribe John McLaughlin, but it might also be interesting to study what John McLaughlin studied. Yes. You know, and to go to their roots and go to the roots of those roots and, and to go back further and further until you, you really start to get grounded in tradition. You know, one of my convictions, and and, and I, I tend to try to be mentally organized about it, these mm-hmm. kinds of things because I teach and I have to be able to back it up. Right. But if, if you look at the history of, 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 of music, um, you start to see that particularly in the jazz world, popular music in the blues, rock, that all of the groundbreakers, all of the innovators, all of the the real geniuses in music have always had their background really grounded in tradition. Yeah. You know, it's no surprise that I'm playing with Billy Cobham a lot now. Mm -hmm. And Billy is one of the greatest straight-ahead drummers. Tony... You know, Herbie, yeah, guys who sort of invented fusion. Right. I mean, they they were sort of the the the, the dictionary definition of, of jazz drummer, of jazz pianist. You know, mm-hmm. um, and so you know, you look down at the history of, of these musicians and you see how much tradition. You know, Grant Green, you know, yeah, sort of cannibal with with what they did for soul jazz and and um, and, and funk. Man, their roots and the tradition are as deep as they go, as mm-hmm. deep as it can go, you know. Well, you have Kenny to know Burrell. where it came from, right? I mean, that have, to me, you can't build your own voice if you don't know, if you only have like half the language. Right. right. You know? But it goes further than jazz. I mean, you look at the great rock bands. Yeah. You know, Led Zeppelin, they were a blues band first. 
Right. Carlos Santana was a Santana blues band first, you know. Um, Stones, you mm-hmm. know, they were all about early. I mean, they appreciated American roots music more than Americans did. <laughs> and that's why there, there was a British rock scene is because they really embraced those roots and, 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 um, and respected them. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the sad things that I'm finding out more and more as I associate with more blues players is how much they feel disrespected by jazz musicians. Really? And it's really, really a shame. It's really a crime, in fact. Because we're just shooting, jazz musicians are just shooting themselves in the foot Mm -hmm. by not really embracing the blues traditions as a continuum, as part of what we do. You know, the blues is in in India. The blues is in Hispanic music. The blues is in flamenco. The blues is in Brazilian music. Yeah. The blues is in all this music. You know, and to not really embrace it 2,000% is, is a mistake. And, you know, George Benson said it best, I think. He said, you know, I really wanted to play the blues. But then I heard B.B. King and I said, I could never be that good. So I decided to play jazz. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Which tells you something. I have all yeah. my students transcribe a B.B. King solo or an Albert Collins or a Stevie Ray or, or, you know. And they usually come back with their minds blown. Yeah, because they don't even understand how to how to bend a string, how to how to how to tweak out a harmonic, how to shake a note. Mm-hmm. There's so much about the, the culture of, of jazz and music that comes from the blues. Forget about guitar, just the music in general. Sure. Yeah, know? and and to not really embrace that, you know, I've been uh, it's kind of an aside, but I've been more and more thinking that that we need to rethink jazz pedagogy in terms of the blues and really teach jazz from a blues perspective. I think there are more and more jazz musicians and educators who are willing to embrace that idea, but they're not necessarily willing to embrace it all the way. As a curriculum item right. probably, right? Right. Yeah. Like it's uncomfortable because, you know, the blues is is very much a cultural phenomenon. Mm-hmm. You know? And it doesn't, you know, in the ways that jazz doesn't fit in with, you know, the the typical university agenda, blues is even further off. Oh, yeah. You know, and to try to put these things together, I think, is is challenging, but it's I think it's important. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, and if you look at that aspect of it and learning the history and, and building things up, right, and then playing all these different genres, you have to have that back back end thing. Now, somebody that you played with, Sting, yeah. right? He's somebody, at least to me, uh, probably on a way uh, shallower level than what you know him about, but I mean, he seems somebody that embraced all the different styles, Absolutely. classical jazz, blues rock, everything like yeah. that, incorporated it in his music, mm-hmm. but he seems like somebody that didn't just kind of like, oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna do this. I mean, he knows yeah. the in-depth yeah. stuff, because I can remember the one band that he had when he had Brantford and he had uh, Hakeem playing drums, and yeah. all this. I mean, that was like, uh, who was it? Uh, Kenny Kirkland Kenny was Kirkland playing piano. keys. I mean, yeah. that's a jazz group. Oh yeah, totally. totally. <laughs> and those guys are throwing down all the rock stuff. Well, and even the you police, play even the them, police, right? you know, was was really initially a ska band, right? Right, right. Yeah, they were a punk ska band, but so the you know he had some experience with. I mean, it was a trend at that time in, in London, but but you know reggae and and those those kinds of beats were huge. Yeah, and uh, and you know he's a knowledgeable musician, intelligent musician, reads well. And, you know, like the British, I mean, British, Britain, I think the great, the British Isles and Great Britain in general is, is, is much more cosmopolitan than America, than the U- U.S., you know, yeah. the States. And um, it's, you know, going back to our Zeppelin and the Beatles and the Stones and Queen. Right. You know, they're yeah. Out. There's the movie, movie, you know, yeah. uh, which was awesome, by the way. <laughs> um, Rami Malek, he kicked it. I, I, I've only the seen the previews. My wife's yeah. been raving about it. She went to see yeah. it. She couldn't. I, mean, I don't know if it's a great, you know, cinematic achievement, but it's if you're a Queen fan, woo! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they do talk about the music a lot. But anyway, you know, you know, Queen is a great example of uh, of the British experience, which embraces you know dance hall music and American music and 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 traditional jazz and you know gypsy jazz, right. you know European right. jazz and. So so much um, you know minutiae music and so many different styles of music that uh, 
it's it's hard. And and I, I think you know Sting is a good example of that. He was very um, open. And so initially, when I was uh, playing with Paquito, he was starting a record company called Pangea. Mm, okay. Um, and he came to listen to Paquito, and heard me and heard me playing classical and jazz, uh, and all the different styles I played, and you know, called me up and asked me if I would you know send him a some kind of tape, yeah, demo tape. And then I I had to at that moment sit down and take stock. And that was a really good moment for me because I was able to say, well, I play electric guitar and I, I play uh, all these different styles, but this music that I've been writing for Spanish guitar that's kind of jazz oriented mm -hmm. is, is I think what I'm going to put on this demo tape. And, and, and on the strength of that, he signed me to his label. Wow. Um, and so I was forced to kind of create a bit of a brand at that point. Right. You know, and that was a, a healthy, healthy step for me. Yeah. And he was super supportive. Super nice guy. And you guys, uh, you guys actually played on one of my favorite shows, uh -huh. uh, the late night thing with Sanborn, because I used to yeah. watch that. It's the first time I saw Miles was on that, wow. and then that got me going into the back thing, and then I started yeah. listening to Tony and all that. I was like, uh -huh. whoa! I mean, that yeah. really kind of. got me. But you were super young, right? When you were yep. playing on there, yep. was that an album that you guys put together? Or he was just playing on that session with you, because I saw mm -hmm. Sting and Sanborn and right. And so they got me on that show. I mean, Sting obviously used his clout to get me on that right. show. To promote the new record, mm -hmm. and we played. A, it was the second record that we were playing a couple of tunes from. And um, and then he said, "Hey, you know, how about I play bass in the band? It'll be kind of cool, what you think?" And I was like, That'd be "Yeah, awesome. okay, all right. I guess we'll do that." <laughs> so uh, we we had to rehearse a little bit and show him the tunes, and, and he's a quick study, and it's great. Seems like a, he seems like another person like yourself that can go throughout all the styles, but really nail the styles, you know, yeah. which is very rare, especially when you're a rock star. Yeah. To be able to do that. Oh, for sure. Right? And for to sure. have an open mind to be able to do that, too. Yeah. You know, in retrospect, I think, um, and I don't really know the details, but I do think that, you know, his enthusiasm for sophisticated music maybe clouded his appreciation of the raw, earthier music mm. that was so much a part of... Um, the, the police, the success of the police. Right. And the success of so many bands. Right. You know? I mean, Queen was never a blues band, but Led Zeppelin was. Right. You yep. know? And as much as I love Queen, I think Zeppelin's leaving a mark that's that's pretty mm -hmm. pretty intense because of their connection to the roots and because they're raw. And I've always, as a classical musician, as a jazz musician, tried to remain as much as I can, you know, willing to... To, to connect to that earthier place because you know a lot of the world music that I play is just pretty earthy oh yeah you know and it's hairy <laughs> it's not <laughs> clean you know and I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in the the cleanliness and the perfection and the pristine performance that we lose a lot of the earth in the music well like one of the fa I mean one of my favorite bands Grateful Dead right yeah and I mean you hear like the board recordings and stuff or the taper recordings from the 70s and if you were an audio person, you'd have a heart attack. But I love that because that's yeah. raw sound. You hear it. You know? And that's sort of what started happening for me is, is, is I realized that the only audience that was out there um, that was embracing a modern musical experience was the, were the Dead fans, the Fish fans. Yep. And so I began to tour in the States. I stopped touring in Europe as much. Um, first with my group mm -hmm. and uh, kind of that Indian I did that I got signed to Blue Note Records right, right. after Pangea and I did a couple of records three records for them and one of them was Deja Vu which was a cover of the CSNY mm -hmm. album and that was a big record in the jam band scene and so I was introduced to them to that scene and my band we started doing festivals and touring a lot and then um, and the Garage Mahal came along, and, and myself and Alan Hertz um, formed that band as a sort of a more high-powered version of, of the Farid Hawk group that was touring. Right, right. And we did about, you know, 200 dates a year for 11 years. Did a lot of touring yeah. in the jam band scene. But I really embraced that scene because it was open-minded and earthy and a lot more, um, more like a, the 
the true jazz audience. The people were dancing, yep. or moving. You know, jazz originally is a dance music. It's a groove music, and to have that still part of the performance experience, I thought was super healthy. Well, that's the thing with it, and that's where I was going with that too. Is into the jam band scene because it seems like um, with the jam band scene. There's no genre specific to that jam band scene. If you're grooving, if it's fun, and everybody's having a good time, you could do, you could you could play Round Midnight as a yeah. ballad if everybody's dancing and having a good time. And, and I it's have. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I have. You know, I mean, people yeah. dig that, yeah. and that it's just such an open air thing. And it seems like you really got your foot into that door, and and you're still in that scene, yeah, right? Absolutely. I mean, you're still doing yeah. festivals all summer, right? Mm -hmm. You're doing a lot of those mm -hmm. things in the summer and touring yep. and stuff like that. That that whole um, genre is really blowing up, but I think that that's where the world's going, don't you? I mean, it's there's no, you're not being pigeonholed. You're yeah. do whatever you want as long as it's your stuff. I mean, I, I think that's totally true. But the other side of it is there are corporate interests now that are so yeah. heavily invested in these different scenes that um that it's unless you're going to have a really organized brand oriented approach. With money behind you, it's it's hard to uh, to take it to that next level. Right, take you know? it to the fish level where they can just tour and they're selling things out three four nights in a row somewhere right. or whatever. Yeah, right. And uh, and I was never that guy, you right. know. So, you no, know, I'm still doing those kinds of things. Raj Mahal is playing again mm -hmm. a little bit here and there, and uh, we're still doing some nice shows and things like that. But as far as you know, doing two hundred dates a year. I, not sure. I'm That's right. a lot of two two hundred dates a year now is a is a lot anyway. Well, I was a truck driver who played music on the side. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and we had a thirty six foot RV and woo. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. went through. Th it's fun though. I mean, you know, oh, it was definitely fun. <laughs> definitely fun. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what you have coming up sure. here in December, because um, obviously we could. I, I didn't steer us down some of those roads that oh, I wanted to because we got to wrap it up at some point here. Sounds but good. this has been fascinating. So you've got, what do you have? You have December 18th. I'm going to just bring this up in front of me here That's so good. I can actually see it. You're playing that new, uh, the new place, December 30th. Yeah. Hey Nani. Uh, hey Nani. In, in Arlington Alter, Heights. With Goran Ivanovich, our duo. Uh, we have a, we're going to record a new album. It looks like it. Also on Delmar. Oh, great. Good. And uh, so that's, that's going to be happening. And we don't need to know. It might be a, an interesting recording process because they have all these new tape machines, old new tape machines. He, that, when I first met with Julia and uh, Elvio, they were talking about restoring things and bringing things in. And, and I, Steve, is, Steve Wagner, the yeah. head engineer there, is just he's just goofy with that stuff. So oh, yeah. we got, you know, they're finding old mics in the, in the closet. And, and, just, and so, yeah, it's going to be exciting to see what kind of, you know, audiophile experience we can produce with this, with this record. So hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be preparing for that. So this concert on the 30th of 30th. December mm -hmm. at Hey Nani in Arlington Heights, is, we're going to be playing a lot of that new music that we're going to be recording. And you're going to be on FMT, WFMT, on December 18th. With the Kaya String Quartet on Impromptu. Oh, great. Okay. And then... Uh, and then LA, uh, New Year's Eve? LA, New Year's Eve, a trance hypothesis New Year's Eve, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to have... I kind of had this dream of doing a 24-hour show. So it's if you're into getting freaky... Come on out. It's going to be 24 hours. We're going to start, and then we're going to keep going until the next day. I think day. I did one of those sets at the Underground Wonder Bar one time that mm -hmm. went on for about like yeah, 10 I did, hours. Yeah, I did one of those, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to keep playing, and I'm just going to go from like the, the funk band, which is going to be part of the dance, and then as we wind down, we'll yeah. get more into the Indian trance stuff. And, you know, oh, yeah. some electronica. And when the sun comes up, hopefully we'll be playing the morning raga. <laughs> Yeah, you're laughing. I'm totally. No, I'm, I know. I, I'm like I'm thinking in my mind, intense, man. It's going to be crazy. Um, but uh, the first half of the month, I'll be on the road in in Europe uh, with uh, Billy Cobble. Mm -hmm. We'll be hitting Paris two nights at the Jazz Cafe, and then we go to uh, in London, and then we go to uh, Moscow. Wow. We end up in Kazakhstan. Wow. So hopefully I'll be. Back. He's a, how old is he? He's in his eighties, right? No, no, no. Uh, Bill is uh, seventy three. Okay. All right. And he's strong. Yeah. He's doing good. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah, that's got to be fun. That's Randy a whole... Brecker on trumpet, a nice band. Oh man, wow. Yeah, that's killer. Uh, you know Paul Hansen. Mm -hmm. Paul's playing the bassoon. It's a killer band. Scott Tibbs on keys, Tim Landers on bass. Yeah, so, and I think there's a trombonist coming with us too. Who I'm not sure who that is, but uh, that's great. 
Well, yeah, so it's you're, super exciting. You're, you're, you're traveling, you're doing all this stuff, and everybody can find out more information. What's your website? www.farid.com. Farid.com. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I got in early. I guess so. I was going to start my own cell, cell phone company. <laughs> this music thing doesn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the Kaya uh, String Quartet. Um, with, so it's Farid Hawk and Kaya String Quartet. New Latin American music for guitar and string quartet that's available on Delmark Records. Delmark.com. Farid, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so Thank you, much brother. for being here. I really appreciate Definitely. this. Like it, yeah. It is fascinating. And as I said, we need to have you come down to the hot dog stand sometime so we can <laughs> wrap up. We, th th down there, we'll talk for six hours. Chicago style. That's it, man. Yeah. Sport peppers, celery mm. salt, the whole nine yards. Oh, that's good. Very good. I like it very much. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much for watching. And, uh, of course, you can get all the information at chicagojazzmagazine.com. Watch the feature interview. You can also read all of our different columns. And until next week, until next month, I should say, thanks so much. And we'll see you then.